the elements of horror. Is it a man in a monster suit? Is it an animatronic puppet? Raising the head. Is it the bone-chilling sound of an alien monster feeding on rotting flesh? For the masters of Monsters and Mayhem, a great horror film comprises all of these elements and much more. War again? Coming up, we'll explore the fantastic movie magic of cinematic horror, from the nightmarish vampires of the silent era to the bloodthirsty creatures in From Dusk Till Dawn. We'll see how classic tales of terror are constantly updated to deliver bigger and bloodier thrills. Oh, look at Green blood. We'll meet the man who was the creature from the Black Lagoon and hear what it was like to be carried away by this demon of the deep. I guess that was one of the things I always could do well. I would just take a deep breath and scream. <laughs> We'll salute the horror masters of Hammer Films, who presented our favorite monsters in living color. And today's visual effects artists will show how they use special props, realistic makeups, and plenty of fake blood to bring us unforgettable scenes of monsters and mayhem. presents Monsters and Mayhem. At a south of the border strip bar, some unlucky travelers are battling to stay alive through the night. This is the vampire free-for-all from dusk till dawn. It was written by Oscar winner Quentin Tarantino, who also performs a memorable death scene. The cast of creatures include some of the most amazing bloodsuckers ever created. To produce the dozens of vampires in the film, director Robert Rodriguez relies on KNB Effects Group. The Los Angeles company has made creatures and character makeups for such films as In the Mouth of Madness, Vampire in Brooklyn, and Army of Darkness. As with each new project, the artists at KNB started with imaginative conceptual drawings. Each vampire in From Dust Till Dawn looks completely different. So right when you think you've seen it, then boom, another one pops up. So the audience goes, wow, it's like there's so much stuff. Every character and every creature looks completely different. And, and that really shows the scope of the amount of work that we had to do in that film, was creating different looks for each character. These vampire characters were created through a combination of puppets, actors in suits, and special makeups. For a scene where a rodent vampire attacks George Clooney, a cable-controlled puppet is built and tested in KNB's shop. Lift it. Right, we need the head lifted up. There you go. Then it's taken to the set and positioned for the film camera. Raise them up, guys. In the actual scene, the metal and rubber creature gives an explosive performance. People are attracted to vampires for a lot of reasons. I think there's a major sexuality about it. I mean, it's very intimate. It's, it's a seduction. I think people are also very intrigued with vampires simply because of the fact that it conveys immortal life. You know, Dracula is based on a real person that did exist. Vampires first appeared on screen in the 1922 German silent film Nosferatu. 
As the story unfolds, actor Max Schreck's makeup goes through progressive changes so that he appears ever more terrifying. In 1931, a low-budget movie introduced audiences to the king of vampires. I am Dracula. Dracula made a legend of a little-known 50-year-old Hungarian stage actor named Bela Lugosi. Well, Mr. Lugosi, what was your first mystery play? It was Dracula. Oh, did the role depress you? Very much. It haunted me. I often dreamed of the dead. In the morning when I woke up, I was tired and depressed. We will not stop until we have discovered the vampires who seek the life of this beautiful girl. While Lugosi's performance remains the classic, modern interpretations have breathed new life into vampires. In Hollywood, vampires come in all shapes and sizes. Today's filmmakers are carrying on a tradition that's three quarters of a century old. I think people really like horror films because it is uh, a form of escape. You can forget your troubles, your worries, and go and sit for an hour and a half and be scared. It's a whole different world. The greatest compliment we could get from the audience about this movie is that this movie overall is really super entertaining. And the monsters are really neat, too. And that means that we've succeeded. We've created an entire film that uh, works on all levels. In 1954, movie audiences were alerted to a new cinematic presence, a deadly creature whose popularity would soon rival that of Dracula and the Frankenstein creature. What was it? Science didn't know. No. Starring lovely Julia Adams, her beauty allure even to the man. The most unique aspect of the picture for me was uh, relating to the creature, to, to really putting one's imagination uh, to the point that uh, these incredible events were happening, that they were really happening. Julie Adams would gain eternal fame as the love interest of this prehistoric jungle beast. But before the cameras rolled, the creature from the Black Lagoon went through several revisions in the Universal Studios makeup department. The final Gill Man look was developed by department head Bud Westmore and veteran makeup artist Jack Keevan. But dozens of talented individuals worked on the costume that would be worn by a 25-year-old actor named Ben Chapman. I watched him literally being put together. And you know, when you're watching sections and pieces being put together, in your heart you wonder, what am I going to look like when I put on it? So the first time I put on a suit, it was like slipping into the skin or body of this gill man. So I, through almost a metamorphosis, became the Gilman. I think Ben had a, a very good sense of menace. One of the things that Ben did so well was the kind of slow and deliberate step so that the creature on land never seemed to just move swiftly and it built the suspense. Achieving that performance wasn't easy. The creature costume was actually a one-piece body stocking over which thick foam rubber body parts were glued. I would report into makeup and uh, we would start. They would have to pull it up to where it would fit every crease exactly. It took two hours, you know, two to three people helping me into that thing. And then uh, you would put your imagination to work and it was not Ben Chapman in his suit anymore. This was an incredible monster from the deep. <laughs> no, don't shoot, don't shoot. Oh, please, do I hit K? 
The creature from the Black Lagoon went on to become the most enduring movie monster of the 1950s. Today, its continued popularity surprises the film's stars. I never thought this film would, would that we would still be talking about it <laughs> all these years later. <laughs> never in a million years. You will see the most amazing sights the screen has ever known in this strangest of all science fiction adventures. In the 1950s, actors in monster suits terrorized movie audiences on a daily basis. Alligator people, mole people, reptile women, monsters from outer space, hideous sun demons, all prowled the silver screen to strike terror into the hearts of innocent sex kittens. One Hollywood filmmaker who has carried on the tradition of creating classic screen creatures is Stan Winston. Winston helped bring such terrifying characters as the Alien Queen and the Terminator to the big screen. In 1989, Stan Winston directed a backwoods horror tale that introduced a new cinematic fiend, Pumpkin Head. Pumpkin Head was a point of departure for me. Until that time, I was very, very closely involved in the design process of every creature that came out of Stan Winston's studio. I was now directing the film. I was not going to design Pumpkin Head. Instead, a team of artists at Stan Winston Studio worked to design a stalking demon unlike anything seen in motion pictures. One of the team, Tom Woodruff Jr., would also perform the role of Pumpkinhead. Pumpkinhead's a demon that's conjured up for purposes of revenge and vengeance, and, and as such, he's not so much a monster as just a uh, dark, evil force. Re reach towards me. The creation process lasted several weeks as artistic vision was tempered with the physical possibilities of the performance. One of our goals in Pumpkinhead was to keep the creature looking very lean and skeletal. We didn't have a lot of room for support, so we simply had some stilts that would give me the proper height. So with Pumpkinhead, the, the trick was having me be able to walk on stilts and have some kind of control and some kind of balance so that I was able to take direction from Stan when I was in the suit. And the direction that I would give is that Pumpkinhead is not a monster. Pumpkinhead is not some ghoul. Pumpkinhead is our worst nightmare. I dug down very deep to think the darkest images that I could come up with to create this evil character and put it on screen. He is the worst side of all of us and is that side that you never want to let out. As long as inhuman beings roam our bleakest nightmares, Hollywood filmmakers will suit up to deliver evil incarnate in striking new forms. An ancient moon is hurtling toward Earth, and a team of interplanetary adventurers has been called upon to alter its deadly course. Fire in the hole. Tunneling through the moon's rocky surface, the team inadvertently reanimates a grotesque fossil with a million-year-old appetite for flesh. Holy Christ. In this pivotal scene from Within the Rock, the first indication of horror is the sound of the beast awakening. I think sound is probably the secret weapon of the horror filmmaker. Uh, I don't think an image can inspire fear unless it's got the right kind of sound to accompany it. For Gary Tunnicliffe, the creation of fear has been a lifelong obsession. I've always loved horror films from when I was really, really young until now. 
and I'd see the Frankenstein characters or the, the Monster Maker characters, and I'd think, that's wow, that's a, I'd love to do that, to be in a basement somewhere, yeah. building creatures and building monsters. As a Monster Maker, Gary has worked on such legendary Hellraisers as Pinhead. The film's producers believe that Tunnicliffe brings essential skills to within the rock. Years of experience in the creature business, obviously, and uh, years of effects work. And uh, he's bringing all that expertise, uh, the pulling off of the movie magic, as far as making uh, a creature, in this case, real. This creature is huge. He's got a ectoskeleton, sort of bony composition. It's a very scary thing to look at. A lot of sharp teeth. We're very happy with it. cut. I think designing and building a creature is probably only the, one of the first steps. Only when an audience can hear it as well as see it can they be really scared of it. The reanimation scene begins with visuals only. Several close-up shots of pulsing, oozing, bony, plate-covered flesh. It's the job of Doug Reed to breathe life into these silent images. As a Foley artist, Doug covers every sound of movement that each character makes in a film. With a handful of groceries and some beat-up props, Doug is about to conjure up the sound of an alien creature being reborn. We're just trying to achieve a uh, reptilian, human-sized creature who's very evil, and uh, he's dry and brittle, and he's got a leathery skin. I use the cabbage for the movement of skin. The rubber chicken has a uh, more of a movement and space to it. And the hair gel, or goo as we fondly refer to it, we use that for, uh, well, goo. The drooping part is good. It's the, the like, slurps and that that aren't working. Just do, like, sticky, drippy, gooey. Okay, ready? All right. After creating several layers or audio tracks of individual sounds, Doug listens to the overall combination of sounds. Once it comes alive, the creature from within the rock begins hunting for food. To create the vocalizations of the creature, the filmmakers turn to sound designer Elmo Weber. Sound design is uh, the creation of a new sound that doesn't really exist in the universe. And um, you can do that by combining that? sounds that do exist or creating them with synthesizers or various processing devices and making something believable, make it seem like, uh, if it's a monster you're creating, make it seem like it's a living creature. For the creature's roar, Elmo uses a combination of animal sounds. Here is a poodle, a toy poodle, the original pitch. Okay. All right, now if I take it down an octave, sounds like that, and then even further. Now we're more like a monster. Okay, and this is a Rottweiler. I used a lot of, a lot of him. There's his original self. And then more of his monster self. Elmo adds a squealing pig. And some breathing sounds that he created using this apparatus he made out of plastic plumbing pipes. By assigning these sounds to different keys on his synthesizer, Elmo is able to compose the creature's roar to the picture on the screen. The result is an otherworldly scream that helps breathe life into a terrifying vision. Set the C4. Set detonator. The actors must also participate in the post-production audio process. Carolyn Barkley, who plays the part of Dr. Dana Shaw, 
is redoing lines that could not be recorded clearly on the noisy film set. This process is called ADR, Automated Dialogue Replacement. How long you got? Even Carolyn's breathing is re-recorded, using a plastic jug to replicate the sound inside her space helmet. Let me see how you're holding this. No, it can't be in front of your oh, head. Oh, it was like, it was okay. like that, yeah. Is that this is what, yeah. inside? Okay. That sounds pretty good. Okay. In the grand tradition of Hollywood horror, the most fearful noise is saved for the big climax. It amazes me, uh, watching any film, to see something that you created out of clay and foam and latex suddenly to be breathing and uh, making these noises and I think they did a great job because rather than going over the top, they made it believable. One of the scariest characters in motion pictures is also the oldest. In 1910, Thomas Edison's film company released the first screen version of Frankenstein. The creation of the creature was achieved by reversing a shot of a melting wax mannequin. Frankenstein has been called the most brilliant novel ever written by a teenager. Mary Shelley was only 18 when she conceived her story of a pathetic creature adrift in a heartless world. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! When Hollywood got its hands on Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's morality tale was transformed into one of the earliest blockbuster horror films. When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men, to shock women into uncontrolled hysteria. This is the blood-chilling story that stuns your emotions. Boris Karloff's 1931 performance was so remarkable that he became Frankenstein's monster for generations of moviegoers. Jack Pierce, Karloff's makeup artist, once said, I discovered there are six ways a surgeon can cut the skull, and I figured Dr. Frankenstein, who was not a practicing surgeon, would take the easiest. That is, he would cut the top of the skull straight across like a pot lid. That's the reason I decided to make the monster's head square and flat like a box. Pierce's concept of Mary Shelley's creature remained unchallenged until 1957, when a monstrosity of shreds and patches crawled from a laboratory vat to terrorize Dr. Frankenstein, played by award-winning British actor Peter Cushing. It wasn't his intention to make a monster that went to raving mad, but you see, it made an awfully good story. Because if he had made just someone who was rather charming, became prime minister, well, it'd be all right, but not quite so interesting as, you know, someone rushing around the countryside looking you know, looking rather ugly. <laughs> Filmed in brilliant blood-red color, The Curse of Frankenstein was the first horror role for a struggling British actor named Christopher Lee. So we had to think up a makeup of our own. And we went through various tests, in which I became more and more unearthly in, uh, in appearance. But if you are literally creating life, you're know, putting somebody together from bits and pieces of other people's bodies, including a brain which has gone wrong. Uh, it's rather like a patchwork. One of the critics said I looked like a road accident. The Curse of Frankenstein broke all box office records when it opened in London. Hammer Films, the British company that produced it, would soon become the most influential and profitable fright factory in the world. No door could ever bar his way. He is back from the dead. Count Dracula is alive. I loved the Hammer films when I grew up. They made it a little sexier, a little bloodier, 
a little more uh, erotic and, a, and a, a lot more gothic in terms of its design and architecture and stuff like that. And the actors were, were all classically trained. I mean, there was something about them that was in, incredibly compelling. Hammer Films followed their initial success by remaking and revitalizing another horror classic. You must help me. You must. You're my only hope. You must. I'll help you. My first thoughts about portraying Dracula were actually very simple ones. I read the book and I decided, right, he's heroic, he's romantic, he's erotic, and he has immense intellectual and physical power. But above all, stillness. Don't do anything unless it really means something. And when I did do something, it was explosive. For Christopher Lee, the universal appeal of Count Dracula is clear. Power physical and mental power most men and don't women dream about a character who is utterly irresistible but above all we get into the question of immortality because the character of the vampire is undead he cannot die he has to live he can only live in one way and that's on blood Dracula the bedeviled master of all that is evil. Many of Hammer's nine Dracula films were shot at Bray Studios, their small production facility outside London. In these rare home movies of 1965, makeup artist Roy Ashton outfits Christopher Lee with special hand-painted contact lenses designed to give a wild, bloodshot appearance. Of course, I couldn't see very well. So if I had to swoop down the stairs at vast speed and, and literally assault some unsuspecting victim, I very often missed them. It was very uncomfortable, very, but enormously effective, of course. For this scene in Dracula, Prince of Darkness, a frozen moat is created with a plaster surface covered in a salt solution to simulate ice. Director Terence Fisher calls action, and the climactic fight begins. Why did you shoot him? It would do no good, my dear. Notoriously low budget, Hammer films often required stars to perform their own stunts. Here, Christopher Lee takes a plunge into a vat of cold water as the ice breaks. The gothic horror created by Hammer Films was hugely successful with audiences, but film critics such as Nina Hibbins of The Daily Worker were extremely hostile. From the moment that Dracula appears, eyes bloodshot, fangs dripping with blood until his final disintegration into a crumbling, putrescent pile of human dust, this film disgusts the mind and repels the senses. Despite the reviews, Hammer Films have influenced an entire generation of horror filmmakers. Christopher Lee went on to appear in seven vampire movies and to play a leading role in Hammer's success. Walk with the undead in their quest for human blood. Today, these scenes of violence seem less shocking than they must have appeared to audiences of the late 1950s and early 60s. But to any fan of big screen chills, the legacy of Hammer Horror continues to resonate through time as Count Dracula eternally roams the earth in search of his next unsuspecting victim. At a film location north of Los Angeles, a team of special effects artists is involved in a unique task, bringing an insatiably hungry underground beast to life. That, that's too stretched forward, Tom. Tom, show, show him an up. up show him, yeah. That's great, right there. The film is Tremors 2 Aftershocks. It's the sequel to the 1990 thriller about a group of isolated misfits battling ancient killer worms. 
In this scene, one of the monsters will burst from the ground in a hellish fury. The miniature set is carefully dressed with tiny vegetation, but the star of the shot is the creature itself. When we did the first movie, when we did the original Tremors, we didn't have this material available when we did the miniature shot. This is something that, that was developed, and uh, we used it first on the Santa Claus for uh, Tim Allen's fat belly, the jiggly belly. And actually, the material still doesn't have a name, it's, but it's, it's just very jiggly material. The material is a natural latex that's heated to 400 degrees and then molded to shape as a puppet to fit over Tom's hand. On film, the hand puppet takes on frighteningly real dimensions. The thrill factor in creating horror effects is that when you do it right, you can really put the audience reaction over the top. You can really peg the meter. Uh, and it's, a, it's very satisfying to see people jump out of their seats and, and uh, scream. For Tremors 2, a new, potentially deadlier creature is called for. At Amalgamated Dynamics, Inc., or ADI, conceptual drawings are turned into a small-scale sculpture called a maquette. Next, a full-size steel armature is built to serve as the skeleton of the creature. All of the movable parts, such as the monstrous tongue, are carefully tested. Real slow now on the tongue, real slow. Action! Finally, their creation is ready to terrorize its unfortunate victims. Apparently the name for these little guys is shriekers because they shriek when they find a food uh, source. The puppet you see behind me is what we call the hero puppet because it's the puppet that we intend to be featured on film the most. It's, uh, it has the most functions, uh, the most, uh, it's capable of the most movements, uh, and therefore is referred to as the hero. And action, raising the head, raising slowly. Eight puppeteers operate cable mechanisms similar to those used in bicycle handbrakes. They work in unison to perform the shrieker's body movements the head, jaw, heat sensors, tail, and tongue. Okay, the nose should not be coming up so high on these jerks. That looks like he's already pulling it loose. You know what I mean? Right. And action! Luckily for me as a performer, they're great puppets. I mean, you can actually uh, believe in them in a sense. They move uh, incredibly uh, with, uh, you know, realism, and they even have this texture, and. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, actually. Oh, no! Oh, not again! When star Fred Ward has to blow this creature away, the filmmakers bring in a less expensive, non-mechanized, solid latex substitute. Plastic bags are filled with synthetic blood and guts, then placed in cavities in the puppet, along with small explosive charges. A nearly invisible monofilament will provide limited movement. Do you want another line on his nose? Yeah. Hey, keep that wire taut, Bruce. Yeah. And action! We wouldn't have done this picture without Tom Woodruff and Alec Gillis. Not only are they family, but they bring exceptional creative artistry to any project that they're involved in. When we started this project, which I think may be somewhat unusual, they were involved from the very get-go. And uh, I think that they delivered uh, superlatively. In the movies, People are often plagued by otherworldly creatures. And in the 1950s, these monsters seemed to come out of the woodwork. These black and white demons were all brought to life by monster maker Paul Blaisdell. Paul was really great at creating, like, monsters and creatures and stuff on account of his imagination. He was just, he could create stuff out of nothing. There's never been another creature that's even come close to looking like that. Memorabilia collector Bob Burns was Paul Blaisdell's close friend and assistant. Although Paul had been an illustrator for science fiction novels and fan magazines, he got into movies in a small way, creating this hand puppet for the beast with a million eyes. It was really neat. He just sculpted it in clay. He just painted rubber over the top of it, different thicknesses, so he got it thick enough, slid it up the back, and made the puppet out of that. 
and then stuff the arms with cotton, and he was actually in the scene working the puppet and making it move. Paul Blaisdell became a master of B-movie monsters. He labored with minuscule budgets and unbelievably tight schedules. In the 50s, the normal shooting schedule was seven days. That's it. That's really fast. I don't know anybody today that could build a monster as fast as he could. Sometimes you do them in two and a half, three weeks. Very fast. He was never really totally satisfied with anything he ever did because he knew he could do better if he had that one extra week. Paul always usually wore the monster suits. It was just cheaper for him to act in them, for them to get an actor to do it. He knew how to work the suits. That was just part of his deal of, okay, you build the suits, you wear the suit, and that's it. Paul's favorite monster role probably was the she-creature. The she-creature was supposed to be a lady who had regressed back in time to her prehistoric self. In 1956, Blaisdell designed his most bizarre creature, for it conquered the world. The monster was built to stay in a cave. It always supposed to be in a cave. The eyes glowed, and you saw these big teeth, and you really couldn't get a real good look at it. And we were at a sneak preview to see it. And everybody was screaming and yelling and having a great time, till at the very end it came out into the sunlight out of the cave, and then it started getting belly laughs, because it did look kind of silly in, in just bright light. And Paul was very upset about that. He, he never uh, really got over that. In the early 1960s, Paul's discouragement with the constraints of B-movie making led him to turn his back on Hollywood. When he died of cancer in 1983 at the age of 56, his death went largely unnoticed. Two, one. Today, the films of Paul Blaisdell are viewed by a new generation of monster fans. People seem to really like these films better now, and I think because they were like unique monsters, uh, they weren't over-sophisticated by any means, and so people could really identify a little bit more with them, had a lot more fun. Horrific special effects have been with us since the very first motion pictures. In 1895, a short film called The Execution of Mary, Queen of Scots presented a shocking historical drama. Trick photography was so new that many viewers wondered if an actress had sacrificed her life making the film. Modern filmmakers have taken gore effects to ever more graphic extremes. We're gonna kill her, right? Today, at Magical Media Industries in Los Angeles, a team of makeup effects artists have set up a demonstration of some of the gore effects employed in modern movie shockers. Actress Kim Kopf will play the unlucky victim, and makeup effects veteran John Beekler supervises the gore. A good gore effect is very much like telling a joke. A uh, stand-up comic will set up the audience and deliver the punchline. Horror or gore is exactly the same way. You anticipate the event, it's around the next corner, you're, you're teased, you're teased, you're waiting, and suddenly, bam, it hits you, just like a punchline. Now we're ready to flow out my intestines. John slips on the glove he built for Freddy Krueger, and the cameras roll. Action! I took a lot of guts. <laughs> when the scene calls for a throat slashing, Beekler's effects crew brings out this special prop. A dull blade outfitted with a rubber tube. On the other end, a syringe filled with fake blood. But some knifings require just a little bit extra. This is a substance called Dermawax. 
Dermawax was originally formulated for morticians to build up cadavers to make them look whole again. Next, rubber mask grease paint is applied to keep the wax moist, supple, and skin-like. Once the appliance is smoothed out and colored, the scene is set for murder. Actress Kim Kopp is an experienced scream queen. She has appeared in such terror-filled films as Screenplay, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and Witchcraft, Salem's Ghost. But no two horror scenes are alike. A rubber arm is the main ingredient for an on-screen dismemberment. The prop is first dressed with fake blood and muscle. We can put it right on top, actually. After Kim's own arm has been secured behind her back, the rubber arm is put in place and additional fake blood is applied to the wound site. Hi, Mom. <laughs> then the cameras roll. Okay. I've been splashed, I've been gouged, and I've been split. Is there anything that you can do without a knife? What, you mean like hand-to-hand? Uh, -hand? Yeah. Yeah, let's go. Oh, okay. Come, Come here. here. Come here. Oh! Oh, come on, John! Ow, that hurts! Come on! Ah! As this demonstration clearly shows, the artistry of special makeup effects can be used to stretch the limits of blood and gore. Today's horror filmmakers never miss an opportunity to thrill us, shock us, or amaze us. Whether it's character creator and director Stan Winston conjuring up a demon from our deepest nightmares, or the crew at KNB Effects Group creating a new generation of blood-sucking freaks, Hollywood effects artists delight in presenting new visions of horror. I really love to sit in a movie theater and see the audience get into the film. And those are my favorite kind of horror films when you're sitting there and the audience is just like, no, watch out, you know, and, and just doing an on through the whole thing. I mean, it, that's all it really is intended to be is fun. Since Boris Karloff's classic portrayal of the Frankenstein creature to Christopher Lee's carnal Dracula, Actors have been continually challenged to reinvent our favorite scary monsters. It's very, very difficult uh, playing these sort of scenes because you've only got to get it slightly wrong with a twitch of an eyebrow or a look, and boom, the scene's gone. And it's a comedy. Action! From an outdoor film location haunted by weird flesh-eating shriekers to an audio facility that's giving birth to a bizarre-sounding alien life form, Hollywood filmmakers work like the devil to make your skin crawl and your hair stand on end. They are carrying on the tradition of using their celebrated movie magic to create unforgettable tales of monsters and mayhem. Come on, come on. 